Well, that's a very warm response. You've clearly come to see Yanis Varoufakis, and he's one of the most uh, famous, also most controversial figures, I think, in Europe today. Um, he's had praise from, you might think, unusual quarters. Michael Gove said that he might not agree with every single position adopted by this Greek radical socialist. I cannot but admire and applaud his courage and passion on behalf of generally progressive causes. Uh, as you probably know, in January 2015, he was an economics professor teaching in Austin, Texas, but then was elected to the Greek parliament and appointed finance minister. For five months, he tried to negotiate a solution to the Greek crisis with the Troika, the European Central Bank, International Monetary Fund, and European Commission, but his efforts were stonewalled, and we all know um, what happened. His new book, which I have here, and the weak suffer what they must, is a quote, taken from uh, Thucydides. The full quote is, the strong actually do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. But Yanis Varoufakis has added a question mark. It's the idea, should the weak be suffering? Exactly. Um, we'll come on to the, all the problems in the Greek economic crisis and the context which you put them in, in your book. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get a sense, first of all, about the political influences in your life, which I think also shed life on Greek recent history itself. And your, your father suffered, didn't he, really, for his beliefs during the Civil War? Indeed. And it's a very interesting story from the perspective of uh, the whole 20th century debacle. Uh, my father was uh, born and uh, raised in Cairo in a mixed family. His father was Greek, his mother was French. In the expat community, uh, his, his, his father was organizing... Um, on behalf of Thomas Cook, Nile uh, cruises for yeah. the British aristocracy. <laughs> so my relationship with Britain is, uh, goes a long way back. <laughs> and my antipathy of the aristocracy, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, his mother was a feminist in the 1920s, uh, an active, energetic one. He grew up reading Voltaire and Rousseau and... Uh, you know, French Enlightenment upbringing. Uh, he was not a communist. He didn't even know very much about communism. And he, at the age of 20, 21, he decided he had a longing to be in Greece. He had never been in Greece. He was in Cairo. And so he landed in Greece to enroll at the University of Athens, the Department of Chemistry. Don't ask me why. Um, right at, during the interregnum, between the first and the second civil war, civil wars between the left and the right. He arrived at the time when there was a lull. It seemed as if there was going to be a truce and parliamentary elections and some degree of stability. And that's why he arrived. And upon entering the university, he became, uh, he was uh, approached by both sides, the left and the right, who were trying to find an accommodation amongst themselves. So they wanted my father to be the president of the Students' Union because he was a UFO. He had landed from, the, from Egypt and he was un, completely non-aligned. He was neutral, yeah. Utterly neutral, by definition. And he accepted. A few short weeks after, when the tensions were building up again between the left and the right, just before the second and most vicious civil war had begun, uh, the rector of the university uh, did something that will ring a bell in this country, uh, they treble the fees. <laughs> <laughs> At the time when students were suffering from malnutrition in the aftermath of the occupation of the civil war. My father, feeling that it was his job as the representative of the students to go to the rector and complain, did exactly that. He put on his suit, his tie, he wears a tie to this day, even when he goes to the grocery shop across the street. Um, so he, he's extremely, he's far more moderate and polite than I am. And he walked into the rector's office and put the case for the, of the students and then left. Upon leaving, uh, three thugs from the secret police grab, grabbed him and took him to the police station and they beat him up. My father was utterly incensed, you know. It was not entirely consistent with French Enlightenment values, what happened to him. <laughs> and then, of course, the good cop came immediately after that, saying, oh, you, apologies, we know you're a good boy, and we shouldn't have done this to you, you know. 
overzealous officers do that kind of thing. Uh, just go home. But before you go home, sign this piece of paper. And this piece of paper was a denunciation of communism. And my father said, sir, I'm not a Muslim and I'm not a Buddhist, but I would not sign a denunciation of Islam or Buddhism because the police asked me to. And that was it. Four and a half years of concentration camp alongside communists. Therefore, he entered the Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> but, and this is how I'm going to end this little soliloquy, even though he was committed leftist as a result of this experience and all his life, uh, when I was become, beginning to be um, politicized and uh, radicalized at the age of 12, 13, joining demonstrations. So one night I was, uh, I didn't come home because I was apprehended by the police for being in one of those demonstrations. He had a, a little one-to-one -one with me and he said to me that, look, I cannot chastise you for joining uh, left-wing activist uh, outfits. How could I? But there's only one thing I need to tell you. And that is that when I was in the concentration camp and we were being tortured and executed, by the right, I knew that if my side of politics, the Communist Party, had won the war, I would be in the same concentration camp with left-wing guards. Really? So beware of the authoritarianism of the left and of our side. So uh, that, I think, is my answer to your question. Really? That's fascinating. It's deeply cynical as well, isn't it? Not cynical. No. Very practical. Think yeah. about it. The Communist parties of Bulgaria and Romania won the Communist Party of Greece lost. Mm. And what did the Communist Party of Bulgaria and Romania do? They created the same kind of concentration camp for the other side. Mm. It's not cynical, yes, it's yes, practical. And, and you have, I mean, you were talking about your childhood and your demonstrations because, because you grew up under the colonels and there's a very mm -hmm. kind of vivid memory you write in the book about your, how your family got the news. Uh, yes, uh, well, we got the news that the colonels came in because the, the secret police broke down our door. But <laughs> so that's a very immediate way of getting the news. <laughs> um, but no, you, you're referring to the story so of the my, radio. Yes. yes. Um, in Greece, during these, that totalitarian seven year period, listening to the BBC, was punishable by incarceration, torture, uh, losing your driver's license, your passport, your existence. Uh, same thing with Deutsche Welle, the German state uh, radio. Um, and indeed, listening to music that the regime didn't like, it was a pretty totalitarian regime. Uh, so my parents, my father had purchased he, actually, in London, he had purchased a very powerful shortwave radio. And my mom and dad used to bring it out and place it on the floor and cover themselves up in a red blanket and listen to Deutsche Welle. For some reason, they trusted Deutsche Welle more than the BBC. Sometimes they listened to the BBC. Come on! <laughs> there was this con conviction that Germany was a, a, a social democratic, progressive democratic country uh, that was assisting Greek Democrats. And actually, that was true. Mm. I remember Willy Brandt and uh, the social SPD regime back then. Uh, and sometimes I would sneak under the same red blanket, just pretending to be listening to the radio, not understanding a word. Of course, it was all in German. Uh, and even when it was in Greek, because there was some radio program, I didn't understand what it was. But it was, for me, it was very exciting, the whole thing. Mm. Yes, I can imagine that's very sort of... So what was it that lay behind your decision to leave Greece behind and to come here to university? Oh, that was my dad. Mm. After the first time I was arrested, he said, son, you're not studying here. You will study in England. I don't give a damn what you study. It can be anything from anthropology to zoology. You're going to England. And how did you feel and about I did. it? I loved the idea. Yeah. Because, you know, as a 17-year-old, getting away from home, um, making your own way in the world, getting to know a different place. It was great fun. Yeah, and, and you, 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 stay, you, you taught here for a long time as well, didn't yes, you? Yes, I stayed here for 10, 11 years. And how, what was that period like for you? Well, look, it was... It, 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 it made me who I am. And uh, but you know how, they, how life in England is. Um, <laughs> You appreciate it enormously, and you have to bitch about it every single second <laughs> of the day. 
don't you? <laughs> so I can't say that was great. I can't say it was horrible. It was a wonderful <laughs> mixture of the best and the worst all wrapped up in one. I have to say that um, I was historically unlucky in the sense that I arrived in October 1978, uh, right at the beginning of the winter of discontent. And then very soon after that, Mrs. Thatcher came in. So my whole university life as a student and as a lecturer uh, was um, experienced in the dark cloud of Thatcherism. Well, see, it's interesting. You said the dark cloud of Thatcherism. Yes. But actually, you agree with her about some things, don't you? I you agree said with her about a lot of things. A lot so of what? things, yeah. You said, uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, you, you, you praised her prescient critique of the Euro's built-in democratic deficit and for seeing the fantasy of apolitical money. Yeah. Well, yes, the, the, that last speech, remember that day when uh, the vegetables uh, decapitate her? <laughs> you, that, you're referring to that wonderful spitting image yes, joke. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she had this little cry, apparently, in the cabinet. She came out, she regained her composure, and then immediately she went to the House of Commons. For, for Prime Minister's questions. Prime Minister's questions. Yeah. yeah the last time she appeared as Prime Minister mm -hmm. in Question Time. And she gave that amazing performance, mm -hmm. because she was obviously quite relieved, um, and decided to just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And some, uh, I don't know, it wasn't Neil Kinnock, it was someone from the other side, decided, what a silly decision, to challenge her on her opposition to the European Central Bank concept. Mm -hmm. And she came out all guns blazing. Uh, and um, made the most pertinent comment that has ever been made about the European Central Bank in the Eurozone. And she said that, and that was a very nuanced and sophisticated criticism, that who controls interest rates in Europe controls the politics of Europe, mm. and that money cannot be depoliticized. And the idea that you're going to create a central bank that will be outside the realm of politics, doing a technocratic business of managing Europe's money is uh, the first step towards very uh, unsavory developments. And she was completely and utterly right. And even though I spent my youth joining every demonstration against Mrs. Thatcher's government that I could find, and there were plenty, <laughs> um, I always had a great appreciation of her. Because every, you know, every time I listened on the BBC to uh, uh, broadcasts from the House of Commons. I always enjoyed listening to Thatcher because the rest were boring. Yes. And uh, the way she would wipe the, f the floor clean with the opposition was astonishing. And I, 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 I believe that it is important to be able to appreciate the enemy. And especially when the enemy says something so pertinent. Yeah. Why not celebrate it? It's part of humanity. And of course, and actually it was, I mean, a, a large part of the reason that the vegetables, as you call them, that, that the cabinet ministers went after was because of her views on Europe and right. her suspicions about right. um, joining you know, the right. exchange rate mechanism. So it's That's right. There. And she was proven completely correct uh, a few months later when Britain crashed out of the ARM, thankfully, mm. and my friend Norman Lamont sang in the bath. It was not the shower. <laughs> he, he has said this to me. Je ne regret rien. <laughs> yes. It was what he, uh, he said he sang. <laughs> and the result is that now you don't have 15% unemployment which you would have had if you were in the Eurozone. And you, you, you go in your book, you, there's a lot of analysis of the Eurozone, and I want to talk about that at, at length. But I'm also interested in the historical context that you put in, in the book, drawing on your experiences mm -hmm. as an economics professor, going back to the kind of problems that you see in having um, a, a fixed uh, exchange rate mechanism. You go back to kind of Bretton Woods. Mm -hmm. Just explain to the audience a little bit about your, your views on that. Well, capitalism has a tendency towards fixing exchange rates. But this is um, always something that you, tr you, you create and then it collapses. The reason why there is a tendency to fix exchange rates is because businesses, especially large corporations, like the certainty of fixed exchange rates. They don't, need to, they don't want to, to worry about uh, how much their raw materials are going to cost them three months from now? Mm -hmm. Or how much money will they be able to sell their wares in another part of Europe or the world six months from now? So there is a tendency towards fixing interest rates. But when you fix interest rates, 
as we did in the 1920s, after the Great War. Uh, and John Maynard Keynes wrote that beautiful pamphlet, The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill, because Churchill then was the Chancellor, and he fixed exchange rates in the context of the golden, gold exchange standard. And Keynes attacked him on this, presently, on the basis that if you take two different economies and you bind them together with the same money, fixed exchange rates, same currency, fixed exchange rates, doesn't matter. Immediately what happens is there is a tsunami of money, of capital, flowing from the surplus part to the deficit part. Yeah? And why does this happen? Take Germany and Greece, which is a very good example, an apt example. Right? Germany is always going to have a surplus vis-a-vis -vis Greece. Because how many oranges can you export to Germany to repay a Mercedes-Benz? <laughs> okay? There's always going to be this kind. Greek cars will never become competitive vis-a-vis -vis German cars because they don't exist. <laughs> so there's always going to be a deficit that Greece has to Germany. Now, what does this mean? Every Mercedes-Benz that goes from Stuttgart to Athens or Thessaloniki uh, means that there is a sum of money, 70, 50, 60,000 euros, that goes from a Greek bank account to a Frankfurt bank account. Mm -hmm. So the more you have the perpetuation of this surplus and deficit situation, this imbalance of trade, the greater the accumulation of money in Germany's banks. And the greater the dearth of money in Greece's banks. That's just, you know, you don't have to be left wing, right wing, Keynesian, monitor. This is just arithmetic. Yeah. So when you have an oversupply of money in, in Frankfurt, uh, you, you have this glut of money in Frankfurt, the German banks have a problem because there are not enough Germans who want to borrow it. So the price of money in Germany falls. And what is the price of money? It's the rate of interest. Now, in Greece, meanwhile, because of the scarcity of money, the price of money goes up. What's the, what's the price of money in Greece? The rate of interest in Greece. So there is a 6% interest rate in Greece, a 1% interest rate in Germany. If you're a German banker, you want to take your mon the money from your banks and find some Greek to lend it to at 6%. Because, you, you know, you, the interest rate that you pay to your central bank in, in, in Germany is zero point something. Mm. You charge six, seven, eight, ten percent in Greece, you make a big margin. Mm. So there is then, so this, so you bind together different countries using a fixed exchange, right? There's a tsunami of capital falling, f flowing from the surplus to the deficit country. Immediately, the banks of the surplus country take this money and give it back as loans to the, to the deficit country. And what usually happens is these loans go into houses, into uh, shares, into various non-productive assets that create an inflation. So house prices go up. Salaries in marketing, advertising, banking go up. Those increased salaries and house prices in Greece, in the deficit country, lead to a feeling, a false feeling, of growth. Everybody's feeling better off. So they get another credit card, they start buying another house, they buy another Mercedes-Benz. Mm. That is good for Germany. It's good for them. Everybody feels extremely happy. Except that what's happening is an accumulation of pyramids in, of paper and unsustainable debt in the deficit country, mm. which is the other side of the surplus of Germany. Mm -hmm. A little aside here. Mm. It is preposterous that one can lambast the Greeks for the increase in debt and celebrate the Germans for their net exports. They are the same thing. They are the same phenomenon. You don't like one, you don't like the other. You can't celebrate the net exports of Mercedes-Benz and lambast the Greeks for the net debt. <laughs> okay? So the, at some point, something yeah. happens in the world, usually yeah. in Wall Street. Yeah? Yeah. And then there's a credit crunch. The yeah. lenders stop lending. So suddenly, the Frankfurt banks panic and they don't lend to the Greeks anymore. Mm -hmm. The Greeks cannot sustain those bubbles, or those bubbles collapse. Yeah? Now, that happened in 1929. That was the 2008 moment back then. Mm -hmm. And then immediately after that, the common currency of that period, which was a gold standard that Keynes was lambasting, uh, collapsed. Britain got out in 1931. The United States with Roosevelt got out in 1933. Who got out last? The, the, the French, 1937. 
And that's why their economy was crashed. That's, in my view, one of the reasons why uh, the French was so weakened by the time the war happened against Germany. Mm. Now, after the war, the Americans had, or oh, during the war, actually, 1943, 42, 43, uh, the Americans could see that the war was going to end. They were, they were going to, the Allies, we, would win it. And immediately they started panicking from an economic perspective. And they were panicking because these were new dealers, remember? These were the, the FDR people in Washington. And they had experienced in their bones John Steinbeck's Graves of Wrath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, did, they, they, they feared the return of 1929, and they had actually said that it was going to happen in 1949. Their fear was that the moment the war ends, and their gleaming, super-efficient factories in the United States that were producing aircraft carriers and guns and bullets and jeeps and so on would stop producing all that stuff. Even if they managed to convert them to produce white goods and cars and domestic appliances, whatever, right? the American economy would not be large enough to, have, to, to be able to absorb everything that those factories could produce. So the combination of the GIs coming home from the front and the reduction in labor demand, and jobs, would create a new Great Depression. So they sat around the table, like Americans do, they're very pragmatic people, and said, okay, so how do we, do we deal with this? The answer is, we have to sell our stuff to the Europeans. The next thought was, but the Europeans are insolvent, and they don't even have money. Europe was in smithereens, remember, 1944, 45, 46, they didn't even have currencies. The currencies were debased during the war. So they, the next very rational thought was, okay, we'll give them the money. That's the Marshall Plan, not just the Marshall Plan. Uh, they, um, there was a recycling of American surpluses, profits, to Europe and to Japan for a period of 15 years or so. And that was not philanthropy, it was just they were just smart people. They understood that to maintain your surplus, you have to recycle it. And that's Bretton Woods. Mm -hmm. Bretton Woods is a combination of, yes, we fix exchange rates, but we recycle our surpluses in order to make them sustainable. But that ended in 1971, and the reason why it ended was because America, by that time, had lost its surplus. Uh, the German factories and the Japanese factories were, became very competitive. Uh, in combination with the Vietnam War, which cost an arm and a leg to kill lots of people for no reason, um, meant that America could no longer had a surplus to recycle. So the whole Bretton Woods system that was leaning on the foundations of the American surplus phew, collapsed. But again, the pragmatism of the United States shone, shone through mm -hmm. in 1971 when Richard Nixon did that which Americans are very good at. They said, oh, this is our creation. It doesn't work anymore. We end it. Yeah. And then John Connolly, who was the Treasury Secretary of Richard Nixon, a uh, former Democrat, LBJ person, came to London and announced to the British government and to the Europeans, um, you're on your own. We've been helping you all for, for two decades now. Now you swim or sink. The dollar is our currency and it is your problem. Mm. Yeah, so interesting, the, the critique there of, of fixed exchange rates. But just going back to something you said earlier, I mean, I understand your criticism of, of German bankers, but would you say... I didn't criticise them. I said that they, they well, did what they had to they, do. They did, okay, they did what they had to do. But what about... It's in the nature of the beast. <laughs> okay. But is it in the nature... What about the, 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 the Greek side, though? Is, is, was, was there a responsibility there? Did the Greek banks have to borrow the money? Should they have taken some responsibility? Should they have not done that? Or are you, are you saying it was I just... Don't believe it, Martha, I don't believe in moralizing. Bankers are not moral entities. You can't expect them to be the ethical guardians of society. But what about, what about they politicians? They try to maximize profit. Could, could the politicians have regulated the banks yes, better of course. to stop them from that borrowing? That is where so, there is yeah. moral responsibility. Mm. But they all failed equally. Mm. Uh, they bought... The, their own narrative, their own rhetoric. Mm. The rhetoric, remember, but you remember, you remember Gordon Brown? Yes. Yeah, do you remember what I he do. had said? That mm. we've eliminated the boom and bust cycle? Mm. Yeah? Mm. Remember Ben Bernanke, the great moderation? All that, that tsunami of capital, this completely unsustainable mm. uh, Ponzi growth was referred mm. to as the great moderation. Mm. They had believed 
the financier's mantra that now we are in a new paradigm. When I, I, I was, a, as an economist, I was criticizing, I was warning, not just my, by myself, with other people as well, Joe Stiglitz and so on, uh, we were warning that this is going to bring about a major collapse, a new de depression. And we, you know, were you doing we're, that when you were inside government? Because you were an economic advisor, weren't you, to Papandreou? Well, what? that was very short, and that was when Papandreou was in, uh, in opposition. Mm. And uh, when I realized that uh, my advice uh, fell on deaf ears, I resigned, and I resigned very early, in 2006, mm. three years before he became prime minister. Mm. So, mm. Um, uh, no, but the, the, the thing is that when we criticized, I'm talking about the 1990s now, mm. on, on to 2000, 2001, especially after the dot-com bubble burst, mm. um, I was being told in no uncertain terms that I am a relic of the past, that I do not understand that we have a new paradigm where risk is now riskless. <laughs> have you heard of the concept of riskless risk? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. That the financial sector managed to diffuse risk and to spread it out so that there would be no uh, causation chain reaction that would bring about a wholesale collapse of the financial sector. Mm. Uh, and politicians love to hear narratives that are consistent with their own very short-termist agenda. And this mm. is where they failed. Especially mm. social democrats. The worst politicians of the 90s and 2000s were the social democrats. And what about the decision then for Greece to join the single currency, to join the euro? What lay behind that? And why, I mean, we, we hear various accounts of, in quotes, you know, that, that Greece cooked the books in order to be able to, to join this club. Well, this is a very interesting question. But first, in the book, I, I mention, um, I, 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 I retell and revise um, an explanation of why we did it why we all got into the Eurozone, unlike Britain, mm -hmm. um, which is not factually correct, but I, li I love telling the story because it's fun. <laughs> but the, analytically, Never let the facts get in the way of a story. It's a great journalistic mantra, too. <laughs> so the reason why I created the Eurozone was yeah. because the French feared the Germans. Oh, yes, I love this story, yeah. Uh, the Spanish wanted to be French. The Italians wanted to be Germans. <laughs> the Dutch had already become Germans, <laughs> as, as had the Austrians. The Belgians wanted to be simultaneously Dutch and French under the Deutschmark. <laughs> the Greeks feared the Turks. The Irish wanted to escape the United Kingdom. And finally, the Germans feared the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> there is an element of truth in this, but it's not factually yeah. true. I just like saying <laughs> No, the, the reason why Greece entered the Eurozone, Italy entered the Eurozone, Ireland entered the Eurozone. These are countries that should never have entered the Eurozone, as the post-2010 events proved. The reason why they did was that there was a, um, an interesting coalescence of narratives. So, if you're a rich Greek living in the northern leafy sum, uh, suburbs of Athens and you have a yacht and a Porsche and whatever, no? you hate the drachma because the drachma keep the, the Greek national currency of yesteryear, keeps devaluing. So the value of your mansion in Paris, in London, if you want to sell it to somebody in Britain, hmm, keeps falling. Um, and you crave a hard currency so that your assets that are, should be valuable, equally valuable to a yacht, which is in France or in, in Southampton, wherever yachts mm -hmm. are in this country. Um, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know either. So. <laughs> uh, usually in the Caribbean, but anyway. Um, that they do not devalue. Simultaneously, the working class were sick and tired of the drachma because they would have a long strike against their employer to secure a 5% pay rise. It would take a loss of income during the strike, and strikes are very unpleasant processes. Um, and then the next day, after securing the 5% pay rise, the Bank of Greece would divide the drachma, suddenly imported goods would go up by 10%, and that would wipe out any gains that the strike had achieved. So there was this uh, coalition of Greek capitalists and Greek workers 
who both had had enough of the drachma. Mm -hmm. And they were, they didn't individually think of uh, entering the Eurozone, but when the, 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 the Euros um, proposals started flooding into Greece by a political class that for its own reasons wanted to enter the Eurozone. Why? Because by being in the Eurozone, uh, the opportunities for advancement at the personal level were massively enhanced. So suddenly you could be, if you were an economist like me, you could imagine that you could be the president of the European Central Bank, or if not a president, on the executive board of the European. So uh, do not underestimate the importance of the prospect of personal advancement by the members of the establishment, the apparatchiks. So if you take together the interests of the ruling class, the working class, and the apparatchiks, suddenly there is a consensus. 92% of Greeks wanted to enter the Eurozone. Mm. And I was, uh, I, I remember I wrote an article in 1998 um, warning against the Euro and arguing that Greece should never get into the Eurozone. And I was, uh, I, th there was this colleague of mine whose name will remain unsaid, who is who has been and remains prominent in uh, European political affairs and economic and financial affairs. And he called me and he said, you, 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 you know, you are verging, he said to me, uh, towards uh, national treason. So, and that resonated amongst a great number of people. But I think there is um, certainly criticism of the Greek government at that time for its... Uh, the way it attempts to join the club, to join the euro, knowing that its public finances weren't in a fit state to be able, you know, I mean, it, it didn't meet the Maastricht criteria on borrowing or debt at all. And let's go back to this idea of cooking the books. Martha, this is, this is a, it's so, such a fanciful proposition. Think about it. Mm -hmm. To believe that, you must believe that the Greek government managed to uh, pull the wool over the eyes of Eurostat, the European Commission, the European Central Bank. Well, that's two things. You could say they that the European it. Commission turned a blind eye. You could argue that, but there is some responsibility for the Greek government for putting forward their fig the, the, the figures government. in the first place, but, isn't there? But they all fudged everything. Every, mm. the, the euro was created through a series of fudges. Mm. Um, let, uh, allow me to tell you exactly what happened. Mm. German, the German elites were split. The Bundesbank, the Central Bank of Germany, did not want the euro. They did not want to give up the Deutschmark, and they were strong-armed into accepting it by Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor, uh, who said to them, if you don't go along with that, I'm going to change the charter of the Bundesbank, and I'm going to end your independence. It's really very simple. This is a national matter. Uh, the euro has to, to go through so that German reunification can proceed. And, and therefore, I'm going to destroy you. So they so reluctantly accepted it, okay? But that doesn't mean that they were happy with it. Uh, and the big question was Italy. Because Italy was a country, Italy is a substantial country, unlike Greece. Mm, yeah. It's a substantial economy, it's a large economy. Gee. And a, a great competitor of many German sectors. Greece has no sector that is competitive against Germany. But every time Volkswagen or Mercedes managed to gain a competitive advantage over Fiat or Ferrari, just to give you an automobile example. Right? What happened was, the Central Bank of Italy would devalue the lira, and suddenly that competitive advantage was wiped out. And there was a very clear and present demand by uh, German industry that Italy should be part of the euro so that there would be no longer any competitive lira devaluations. So they had to get Italy in. It was a political decision to bring Italy in. Italy had the same debt problems as Greece. So Italy violated the Maastricht rules just like Greece did. Yeah? Greece a little bit more, but not much. Yeah? <laughs> now, to get Italy in, they had to find a way of pretending that the Italian numbers were better than they were. And what do they do? Because they're not particularly inventive, these people in Brussels. Uh, they, they, they subcontract all this work, to Goldman Sachs in particular, J.P. Morgan, you know, because these people know how to, yeah, <laughs> to disguise, to be economical with the truth, let's say. Eh? So Goldman Sachs goes to Italy, 
and they perform various tricks. And then the Greek government, and in particular a high-ranking member of the Greek Central Bank, who used to work for Goldman Sachs by accident, <laughs> yeah, brings Goldman Sachs into Greece to do exactly the same thing. And let me give you an example of what that meant. Right? So let's say that there is a chunk of debt, take 10 billion, that you want to hide. You want to pretend that it's not on the books of the bank, of the, of the, of the state. So what you say is this. Goldman Sachs comes in and writes a contract, a very complicated financial contract, which says that anyone who owns this piece of paper has the right to collect all motorway tolls from Greece for the next 30 years. And then what it does, it takes this piece of paper, takes it, the Goldman Sachs takes it to its clients and says, how much do you want to pay for this? And they give you 10 billion. And then you take this, you sell it, the money goes into the Greek state coffers and you say, ah, see, we reduced the debt by 10 billion. Yeah? So this, these are the kinds of tricks that they did. Mm. Now, I was talking to one of the senior members of the Greek negotiating team with the European Union in the 90s. And I said to him, okay, so how, how did you do it? How did you do it? How did you convince mm. them to do it, to mm. fudge? Mm. And he said, listen, what we did was, firstly, we didn't do anything that was not legal by the Eurostat rules. Maybe it was unethical, mm. maybe defied logic, but it was not contradicting any <laughs> of the Eurostat rules. <laughs> Secondly, we did exactly what the Italians did. Mm. And when they confronted us, because the Germans, the German government, confronted the Greek ones and they said, um, oh, well, you're a basket case, we're not getting you in. And, the, and this person who was leading the negotiations, whose name will go unsaid again, um, turned around to the Germans and said, OK, if you leave us out, we are going to spill the beans about what you accepted from the Italian side. So it was really very simple. It, uh, this, this was too much trouble for the Germans to have to deal with. They said, ah, bring them in. OK. That's how it happened. And, and but it know... was not lying. It was, <laughs> and you know what the proof of this is? If you go today to Eurostat, just go Eurostat.whatever.eu. Uh, and look at the Eurostat's own data on Greece. You'll see it's the same. They've not, if, if we had fiddled the books, they would have gone back and done their homework and changed them. They haven't, because they, those, the, the, there was fiddling. But everybody fiddled. The Germans fiddled. Who were the first ones to actually violate the Maastricht rules once the Euro started? Okay. Germany. Well, we know what the consequences were, which was the terrible economic difficulties in which Greece found itself, mm -hmm. and you found yourself at, at the height of the crisis. And when you look back to those very frenetic negotiations, is there anything you regret about that time? Plenty. Um, but I don't regret the main position. The main position was that we were elected to speak truth to power, to say to them, for six years now, you've been in connivance with the Greek authorities before us. You've been conniving. You've been pretending that the Greek state is not bankrupt. And you've been extending and pretending this bankruptcy. You've been giving us loans in order to pretend that we are repaying the existing loans under conditions of austerity that shrink our income. It's like, for instance, somebody, you know, a friend of yours, um, telling you that their income has been reduced for some reason and they can't meet their mortgage repayments and they ask you for your opinion. Should we, we get out a credit card and draw from the credit card every month to repay our, our loan? And in addition, something that your friend would never say to you because it doesn't make sense, but it, this was the situation with this. And the condition for getting this credit card is that we will shrink our income further. Of course, an 80-year-old can tell you that this cannot end well, and you would, if you were a friend, a genuine friend, you would say to your friend, don't do it. So we, 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 this was what we put to the Greek people on, in January 2015. We said we are going to go to them and say, let's renegotiate this deal. This deal is unsustainable. It's bad for us and it's bad for the creditors. You see, there were people around that time in Germany and in, in this country who were saying, you know, I've understood Greece's difficulties, but were saying, look at your system of tax collection. Mm. There is, I mean, Greek has its problems, but there are plenty of people in Greece who aren't paying income tax, if you, if you paid more tax, you wouldn't be facing the same kind of public squeeze on your public finances. 
Well, firstly, let me make the point that this is not, strictly speaking, true. It is true that, that we had huge tax evasion in Greece, we still, still do, not as much as we did, but we still do. But look at Spain and look at uh, Ireland that didn't have these problems. They collapsed just as well because the Eurozone is such a problem. But let me answer your question directly. When I moved into the finance ministry, I did two things in this regard. The first one was to try to convince the, only, the most sensible part of the Troika of lenders, which is the International Monetary Fund. Uh, yeah, a left winger is calling the IMF sensible. <laughs> this is the extent of the crisis. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> compared to the others, I meant, okay? <laughs> And I said to them something along those lines. I said, look, mm. the problem we have is tax compliance and tax evasion. And also we have a recession, because the recession is destroying incomes and therefore we are collecting less. We, in, in Europe we have amongst the highest uh, rates of VAT and we have a very high corporate tax rate. We had 26% 26, 26 corporate tax in a, in, a, in a country where companies are really suffering. Mm. And we had 23% VAT on almost everything. And we collect very little VAT because people don't pay it. Um, and, and during the crisis, after 2011-12, the majority of those who didn't pay VAT didn't pay it because they couldn't pay it. Because you know, if you take a small corner store about to close and the pensioner who is starving, if you make the pensioner pay 23% on bread, then he will starve even more and the corner store will close because he's not going he's to pay it. Yeah? Yeah. And so they trade under the table. So my, my argument to the, to, to the IMF was a very right-wing argument, a typical Reaganite, Thatcherite argument. That's why I get on so well with Norman Lamont. Uh, my proposal was, let's reduce the tax rate from 23% to 15%. And let's reduce the corporate tax rate from 26% to 20%. And I will go out there and I will start a campaign where I will look the, my voters in the eye and I say to them, Let's get into a new social contract. I will reduce your taxes, your tax rates, and you will pay them. What do you think? Shall we do that? And at the same time, increase surveillance, compliance, and so on. So that was the first thing I tried to do. Yeah. Do you know what happened with this? I, ha uh, I reached the point after long negotiations where I shook hands with the IMF representative on this. We agreed. A week later, they took it back. Why? That's, I don't know. Okay. But the second point, this is important, Martha, if I may just very quickly yeah, say. I want to move on, yeah. We started in the ministry uh, a small team of un untouchables to try to catch the large tax evaders. And we used quite sophisticated software for doing that. I had to lean upon our bankers for two and a half months to get all the data regarding transactions from one bank account to another for 15 years in, on DVDs. That wasn't easy to get this data from them. Mm -hmm. And to compare it and contrast it with the tax returns to catch them. And we caught 480,000 of them. But we, in order to get to the point where you actually prosecute them and where you're actually getting money back, mm -hmm. it was going to happen in October 2015. Let me now give you a, a, a rather startling piece of information. Mm -hmm. After my resignation, the Troika insisted and succeeded in disbanding that unit. Because the Troika of lenders are the tax evaders' greatest friend. Because the greatest tax evaders are the oligarchs that are in cahoots with our creditors. Right, okay, well, interesting. And, and I, I do want to open it up to the floor, but just one final question from me, which is, given all the criticism that you make of uh, EU institutions, huh. you're against Britain leaving the EU. So what's all that about then? <laughs> Well, at the discursive level, the fact that we have a dysfunctional family does not mean that we, sh we should smash it up. We need therapy. <laughs> not divorce. Not divorce. <laughs> but at a more practical level. I, it, Britain cannot leave the EU. You can vote to leave the EU, but you're not going to leave the EU. What will happen is that you will still be ruled by the EU regarding industrial standards, uh, market regulation, and environmental protection standards. In a sense, most of your le legislation is going to be determined by Brussels. Uh, and you will simply not be there to even have a say or a veto. So you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave, as Hotel California says. <laughs> so there is no gain from leaving. 
and there is a great deal of damage that you will do by leaving because Europe is, it's a mistake to think that Europe is out there, it's a club, and it's a question of whether you want to be a member of it or not. The European Union is not a given out there. It is disintegrating under the weight of its hubris. The problem is that if it collapses, and if this disintegration is sped up by Brexit, we're going to have a new Great Depression in Europe that will consume Britain whether you vote to stay in or out. And I want Britain to stay in because Britain is a significant ally for the rest of us in Europe to try to get our house in order in Europe. Obviously, other arguments are available on the Leave side. I will say for the sake of balance, perhaps not so much in this hall, but I would like to take some questions from the audience. Um, 18 months ago, uh, Syriza won the January 2015 election, campaigning on the slogan, Hope is Coming. In the intervening 18 months, the obvious tensions within both the Eurozone and the EU generally have intensified, not least with our referendum that you've just been speaking about. Would you say hope is still coming and perhaps in your answer say something uh, to explain to us what actually DM uh, 25 is? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hope stumbled and fell in July of 2015. We were crushed. There was a coup d'etat. There's no doubt about that. And the only reason why the IMF turned back on its agreement regarding VAT and so on was because the creditors decided that they don't care about getting their money back from Greece. They are much more interested in making, give, sending a signal to the Spanish, to the Portuguese, to the Irish who had elections coming that if they dare vote for a government that confronts the Troika, you know, this is 19th century vulgar power politics. So we, we lost the battle. But Hope has to be revived, and I feel it percolating through this room. Every time I meet people in Germany, in France, in Latvia, in Portugal, I see that Europeans are fed, sick and tired, they're fed up with this recapitulation of failed policies. Uh, I don't think we should be optimistic, but we should have hope and build upon it. As for Diem, this is exactly what it does. The Democracy in Europe movement, thank you for mentioning it, which some of us started throughout Europe, uh, we began in Germany, in Berlin, in February, is all about this. It's about creating a, a surge of democracy throughout Europe that will succeed where our predecessors failed in 1930, a year after the crash of 29, to create a broad alliance of Democrats, whether they are left-wing, right-wing, progressive conservatives, liberals, to stem this descent into an, a, a new 1930s abyss. That's DM25. Okay, so we're going to take this question oh, the, here, and then there's somebody behind you we can go to next. Yeah, I know that was a brilliant uh, talk. We enjoyed that very, very much. The thing I'm concerned about is, as Mervyn King says, that the Greece has reached the end of the euro. Are we going to go back in Greece to the drachma? The pain will be a little bit difficult in the beginning, but will this be the panacea to rescue Greece? What do you think? As you can imagine, this uh, has been a question that has been in my mind for years now and torturing me, not just me, my colleagues and my friends and most Greeks. The, the reason why I didn't, as finance minister, trigger the return to the drachma is because, unlike Norman Lamont, who had the pound linked to the Deutschmark, and all he had to do was just sever the link overnight, we didn't have the drachma to devalue. And to go to the drachma, do you know what it means? It means 10, 12 months of preparation. But the moment you announce the preparation, the whole thing collapses. So it's like, remember the Harold Wilson great devaluation back in the 60s? Imagine if he had announced it 10 months before it happened. The whole British economy would be liquidated. So once you're in, it's very difficult to get out. Now, that doesn't mean that I would, be, that I would allow Schäuble, Dieselblum, the IMF to scare me into submission by threatening to throw me out of the Europe and back to the drachma. But it's one thing to say that this is my policy, to go to the drachma. It's quite another to say, I'm simply not going to sign a sordid deal just because you are threatening me 
with something that you don't have the right to do. And the next question. Um, one yeah. of the vegetables that you refer to, Nicholas Ridley, uh, described the European Union in 1990 as a German racket. Do you agree? No, I don't. He's wrong. The European Union was designed and implemented by the United States of America. Let's not forget that. And all member states were accomplices in its creation. Uh, take, for instance, France. France has always seen the European Union, the French elites, there's no such thing as France. I'm talking about the French elites, the graduates of the Grand Ecole who run the institutions of the French state. They've always seen monetary union as a way of usurping the Deutschmark, using the credit worthiness of the German currency to expand their own control over the rest of Europe. Yeah? And the, the reaction to this action comes from a Germany that is trying to defend its Deutschmark from the French. And then you add to this mix the Italian elites that are very or were very intimately linked with the mafia, with corruption and so on, who wanted to enter the euro in order to expand their own legitimacy within Italy. So all the ruling elites in the European Union had their own grabby reasons for wanting to be part of this dysfunctional eurozone. Although I do not blame it on the Germans. They would say it's a way of keeping Germans. the peace, though, wouldn't they? They would say that after the Second World War, it's a way of binding countries yeah, 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 together same. in a grand project. Of, hmm? of course. Of course they would say that. Yeah. Uh, and there is no doubt that the people of Europe craved the creation of a European Union so as not to have to another war. But the elites cynically exploited that sentiment in order to pursue their own uh, interests by creating an economic architecture which was effectively that of a cartel and which can, could never survive the end of American dominance because America had designed this whole architecture. Okay, and another question. Is there anybody on this side of the room? Yep, there, lovely. If you were chief executive of the Varoufakis Bank, of which and, bank? Uh, the Varoufakis Bank. <laughs> and you found it's an interesting yourself, concept. Uh, sitting on a great pile of money mm. on, uh, ja on June the 24th, would you be happy to uh, lend it to this country? Would I do what? Happy to lend it to this country? <sighs> well, on which assumption? If I were a speculator, I would. What, what that means is that I would be quite happy to lend it to particular companies and uh, sectors in this country, as long as um, I could get it out of this country very quickly once this bubble bursts. You ask me, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, and the question here. Thank you. One thing that's underlying what you've been saying is that debt rather than equity. Do you um, agree with the idea that people have been addicted to debt in the Western world? One of the reasons that the rich are getting richer is because they're the ones who hold equity. They're prepared to suffer some short-term loss and get a, a long-term gain in, in profit. Do you think now is the time to educate everybody in the difference between equity and debt, that um, borrowing to uh, buy a house is, is actually a financial mirage, that people, when, they, when the, the countries join the euro, have um, turned uh, uh, gorged on debt, and that was the, the principal cause of, of the problems, and it's now time to move that forward with the programme of education, financial education. Yeah, it would help, wouldn't it? I, mean, I, remember, I remember when I lived in England, back in the 80s, and people used to say, I bought my own home, and I would say, no, you didn't. The bank bought a home, and you have 2% equity in it. <laughs> remember back the, you know, in the old days, days when... Uh, you would put 0% up front and not even pay any part of the capital for 30 years. Uh, the endowment uh, loans. The mortgages, uh, mortgage. yeah, yeah, those? yeah. There's a lot of scandals you, around So you're quite right. But let me make just yeah. two quick points, more general ones. First, debt is to capitalism that which hell is to Christianity. Unpleasant, but essential. <laughs> it doesn't work otherwise. Okay. That, and the second point, very, very briefly, is that 
when the Americans created Bretton Woods, hmm, they made sure that there would be no need for this education because in the Bretton Woods Conference, this is something I should have put in the book, which I didn't do. I forgot to, to mention it, so let's just add it uh, as an addendum. Um, do you know that in that amazing conference that designed the future of finance in the West, not one banker was allowed to attend? Can you believe that? And that was at the express um, command of uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And if you think about it, the world, the, the, the world of banking during the years of Bretton Woods was extremely boring, as it should be. Bankers made no more than twice what other professionals made. So the, 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 the wage differentials were tiny. Uh, they had very few degrees of freedom. Interest rates were fixed. There were no derivatives. There were capital controls. If you wanted to take a huge amount of money from Britain and take it to America or to India or wherever, you had to explain why you're doing it. You had to have a permission, a written permission from the Bank of England and the IMF. Uh, those were the days, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and one last question, I'm afraid. We've nearly run out of time. Yes, thank you. Um, you've referred a number of times to the um, United States relationship with Europe, um, and I wondered what you thought might be the implications of a Trump presidency in November? Well, I shudder to think. We have two minutes left. <laughs> I shudder to think. Um, when I want to give myself some solace, I remember the days of the, the last few days of uh, 1979, when we were waiting for President Reagan to be inaugurated. And to me, Ronald Reagan, if you read what he was saying in the run-up to that um, inauguration, he was, he was a very, very frightening man. So I'd like to think that maybe this is a chance that Trump would be a new Reagan, transformed in office. Because Reagan was a great monetarist who was going to slash and burn and use austerity everywhere. And he ended up being the most Keynesian president the United States had since Roosevelt. He said he was going to bomb Russia, but he came up, to, he came, he, he came up with a pretty decent um, nuclear disarmament agreement with uh, Gorbachev. Yeah, Rikivik. So yeah. Americans are perfectly capable of um, changing their spots. Uh, but, but then again, this, 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 these tho are thoughts that I have w only when I've had more than two glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> But In good company. <laughs>